Thank you. Thank you. Well, I am, uh, I am truly honored to be here. Uh, I have always been a fan of Drake University. Uh, mine, Marty, who moved to Urbana, uh, taught here for years and has spoken so highly of it. And uh, if he's any example of the kind of folks that come out of uh, Drake, I'll tell you, you've got the best there. And 34 years of teaching at the University of Illinois, my favorite student of all time actually came out of Drake as well, uh, sort of a background. Well, even though I have taught for so many years, it's hard to remember uh, how far back, I still get nervous before I speak to an audience. And so I grew up Baptist. Now, I want you to know that in the 34 years at Illinois, I made it all the way to Presbyterian Elder, and I think if I'd have lasted the two more years where I'd have maxed out my retirement, I think I might have made Episcopalian because I was on my way up. <laughs> but when you get nervous, you go back to your roots, and so uh, I always feel a little uncomfortable, so I grab a Bible and read a little bit and have a prayer. And I just noticed at the Holiday Inn Express that the Bible's a little bit different here uh, in this section of Iowa, and the creation story goes a little bit like this. God is uh, creating the world. And uh, suddenly Jesus says, Mother, you have left out our particular this morning. He said, Oh, well, we'll make it up to them then. We'll give them not flat land like Urbana, but some nice rolling hills, but still the rich, rich soil. And we'll even give them beautiful rivers. And uh, we'll give them the kind of people who can create financial institutions and insurance companies and great institutions of higher education. At which point Jesus said, Well, don't you think you're overdoing it a little bit? At which point God responded, not when they find out who their neighbors are. So I'm one of those neighbors from two directions, that is, for 34 years at the University of Illinois and now uh, back to South Carolina. And maybe I should give you a little warning, too, now. Uh, for 34 years, I was a historian of the American South at the University of Illinois. I became a Lincoln scholar, wrote a book on Lincoln, and I moved to South Carolina. Now, I hope that does not mean that you will question my judgment of Lincoln and the Civil War, but that is probably only fair to do that. Now, I don't know if you can begin by digressing or not. There's probably not some more around, but I want to take a moment because I think we really are in a crisis in education, and I think we have an audience here uh, of both educators and those who care about education, and I thought it might be fun to just take a brief moment to talk about what Lincoln thought about education. I mean, Lincoln is really the poster child, I think, for education. I was involved in a movement called uh, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. I've tried to tell people that it's not about teaching, it's about learning. And Lincoln was someone who not only was self-taught, but knew how to learn. And it's so important, his belief in education. And he himself really wanted others to have the opportunities that he didn't. I was challenged to come up with the 30 most important documents, or at least documents that show change over time of Lincoln. And I think I have read every known document that we have that Lincoln has read. At least they, they keep finding one or two here or there, but I think I have. And that was maybe the most difficult thing I ever do, to put a small little book like this, The Essential Lincoln. And two of those, and that's not an insignificant number, I thought were critical because they're about education. They speak directly to Lincoln's views of education. Uh, and I want to just, and how education is linked to democracy. I want to share those uh, a little bit. Because I think Lincoln revered the Declaration of Independence, which I'll speak about some tonight. And he spoke so highly of Jefferson uh, and wrote on liberty. And they were both champions of the common man. We too often see Abraham Lincoln as a 19th century Jeffersonian. But Lincoln was no strict constructionist. Lincoln's link to the founding fathers was to Alexander Hamilton and John Marshall. His Whig politics were the government of intervention of Daniel Webster and his real beau ideal, of course, the Kentuckian Henry Clay and the American system, which many argue is that he basically implemented during the Civil War. Lincoln understood something that many of us, I think, don't quite understand today, even, and it worries me about our education system. Democracy is not static. It evolves, and it can also go backwards. Uh, it progresses, and it retracts. Lincoln's very first known public political statement, shortly after the 23-year-old had lived in New Salem for only six months, on March 9, 1832, he wrote a letter to the people of Sagamon County and proclaimed, this is when he announces he's actually going to run for office. He's only been there six months. And uh, interestingly enough, it is the only election. You hear all these rumors about how many elections Lincoln lost. 
This is the only election, I believe, where the people actually had the vote. It wasn't the legislature, but the direct vote to the people that he actually lost was his first one. So it's a little bit different take on it when you realize that it's the House of Representatives and the Senate that voted when you talk about all the elections Lincoln lost. Quote, upon the subject of education, not presuming to dictate any plan or system respecting it, I can only say that I view it as the most important subject which we as a people can be engaged in. For my part, I desire to see the time when education, and by its means, morality, sobriety, enterprise, and industry shall become much more general than at present, and should be gratified to have it in my power to contribute something to the advancement of any measure which might have a tendency to accelerate the happy period. I also included Lincoln's September 30th, 1859 address at the Wisconsin State Agricultural Society in Milwaukee. Here Lincoln is answering the South Carolina Senator James Henry Hammond's class brace pro-slavery mud seal theory. We're in farming country, uh, though I know we're a little bit removed here in the city, but does everybody know what the mud seal is? My students don't anymore. I grew up on a farm. Mud seal, in the old rail fences, the bottom rail is your mud seal. It sort of also keeps the mud off a of thing, but people would rake their boots over it and put mud on it. And this was Hammond's theory. And, and it's important, actually, because there was a debate about democracy and what this republic was going to be. And he argues every society needs a bottom rail. And, of course, in the South, that bottom rail were African Americans who were enslaved. And uh, so Lincoln is, in fact, answering this. And, it, and I think it's been read not incorrectly, but people have really read it as Lincoln's defense of free labor, which it is. But it's also Lincoln's statement on the critical nature of education to a democracy. Um, uh, I don't want to say the, the scholars have been wrong, I just think they've emphasized it, and one side of it and not the other. Lincoln calls for universal education, and I think it underscores his belief for the need of education if you're going to have a democratic society. In part, Lincoln stated, quote, by the mud seal theory, it is assumed that labor and education are incompatible and any practical combination of them impossible. According to that theory, a blind horse upon a treadmill is a perfect illustration of what a laborer should be. All the better for being blind that he could not tread out of place or kick understandingly. According to that theory, the education of laborers is not only useless but pernicious and dangerous. In fact, it is in some sort deemed a misfortune that laborers should have heads at all. But free labor says no. Free labor argues that as the author of man makes every individual with one head and one pair of hands, it was probably intended that heads and hands should cooperate as friends and that that particular head should direct and control that particular pair of hands. In one word, free labor insists on universal education. Now, before I start talking about some of the points in the age of Lincoln, I should ask first, has anybody even read the age of Lincoln? I've been recommending it for years in all my writing because it's a sure cure for insomnia. It's not addictive. I think the American Medical Association, and I appreciate you having them for sale. I do want you to know that I will go with you to the RAS because all proceeds from my books go to gifted children. And I will go with you and argue to the cows come home that my seven grandchildren are the most gifted children in the world to get those proceeds. <laughs> But I want to talk just briefly, uh, since it's sponsored by the library as well, that you do take a look at the website, theageoflincoln.com, where I've actually tried to marry a book and the Internet, providing more extensive notes and discussions. Uh, I was inspired to include primary documents upon which the age of Lincoln's interpretation is based because my thesis advisor from many years ago, Jim McPherson, uh, was kind enough, gracious enough to read the manuscript. And there's a lot of places we disagree, but one in particular he did not like my interpretation of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis' response to the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. He says, I've never seen this. Everything I've ever seen says that Jefferson Davis was very sad and saddened when he heard that Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated. Now, I argue very differently than most historians who make the case that Jefferson Davis did express regret about Lincoln's assassination. So in responding to Jim, I photocopied the testimony of Louis F. Bates at whose home in Charlotte, North Carolina, Davis was staying on April 19th when he learned of Booth's success. Bates testified then in the Lincoln conspiracy, murder conspiracy trials, 
that Davis quoted from Macbeth, if it were to be done at all, it were better that it were well done, meaning that the conspirators should have completed their goal of also killing, of course, Vice President Andrew Johnson, Secretary of State William Seward, and War Secretary Edward Stanton. So what I've tried to do, I worked a lot at NCSA, that horrible sound is sort of an acronym, but it did good things like bring us, in fact, uh, in many ways, the, the graphic browser that we all think of when you use Internet Explorer or Mosaic or any of those things. Uh, and scientists always make their databases and their evidence available for other scientists so they can reproduce it. And I thought, now wouldn't that be interesting for us to do as historians? Let's put up all of the information that's in the public domain, uh, primary sources that I have used so people can see where my interpretation comes from and where people disagree and disagree. So the website contains excerpts from the book. I actually did uh, want to, I guess I would give it away because I put the whole thing on the website, the entire book. And then uh, my publisher threatened to sue me and discovered it's actually not my book <laughs> anymore. But... Uh, uh, I wanted people to read it. That's why we write and get engaged, and, and you can. In fact, uh, there's discussion list there. I want people to disagree. I emphasize it's an interpretation, and I will respond. You can email me there if you, if you want to. Just go there, and there's a place to email, and I do. Sometimes I take a while to take uh, to get it done, but I do respond. It gave me the opportunity also to do more extensive documentation, what historians call historiographical discussions. I can show where I disagree with other historians, how they disagree with me. In some cases, try to explain why there are disagreements over what seems like to most people a fact. Um, uh, a number of things that, that are there. What I really want to do, let me just say, how many of you are any of you public school teachers? I think you are doing God's work. I really do. And one of the things I thought this would be an opportunity, I've had a lot of fun working with several school districts and, and in the public schools. Amazing me, even students in the fourth grade are into historiography and they get excited about it. I think we've underestimated people's sort of interest there. But I wanted to show at least how historians, or I should say at least one historian, frame historical problems, how historians use evidence, and how historians produce a historical narrative. I hope the website makes this process as transparent as possible. And I also hope that the website might engage an expanding generation of younger folks at home on the Internet. And I got, it's been almost two years now, it was in June, in one week, sort of sad testimony. I was not surprised to get an email that week from a student who was in high school who said, I never thought I'd read a book because I have a 15-year-old granddaughter, and I'm so happy she loves to read. But her younger siblings... They aren't reading. It just breaks my heart. They are glued to the Internet. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I think there's something very special about the arguments that go in to a book or even articles that make the kind of linear arguments that are so important for us to learn and work with. It's not just reading for pleasure, but also the way our mind works. What really shocked me is in the same week I got an email close to verbatim from a student in, if not the top engineering school in the world or the United States, certainly one of those that said exactly the same thing almost. I never thought I'd read a book. I couldn't figure out how a junior in college could get to that place, but uh, uh, it is a new world, and, and I'm hoping that in that case uh, he even bought a copy for his father for Father's Day, so it made me feel good. Right, but, well, already Lincoln is the most written about American. Only Jesus Christ and Shakespeare have more written about them than Abraham Lincoln. I used to think it was Napoleon. I'd said it for years. You'll see it. And uh, USA Today on Lincoln's birthday in February last year called me, and over two hours I talked on the phone, and I'll, I'll sort of summarize a little bit what I talked about tonight. I was trying to explain that, of course, Lincoln was racist. It was a racist age, a racist time. But he was less so than others, particularly of other parts, and that he changed and he grew, which I think is a remarkable story for us to understand. Uh, and the quote in USA Today was, University of Illinois professor says Lincoln racist, but I was trying to say the opposite, so I'll try to clarify it here today. At the same time, though, they were right when they said Shakespeare uh, is second and Lincoln is third, if you check it out in, in different ways. And I'm a little bit worried about Shakespeare's place because if you just count up the number of books during this bicentennial that I've been asked to review that are new by Lincoln, I, I think Shakespeare has some, some problem to, to holding on to his second place. 
Well, then I'm often asked, why another book? And therefore, what is different then about my book, The Age of Lincoln? I try to make it comprehensive and interpretive. Now, tonight I'm not going to cover everything, I promise you, but thought you might enjoy hearing about a few of the topics where I think I've made either new arguments or done something different from most scholars of the Civil War era. Now, first, I was interested in Lincoln's legacy and to an answer to a question that I want to rephrase from President Bill Clinton's more infamous line, I believe. Rather than worrying about what the meaning of is, is, I think that we are interested in what the meaning of us is. Lincoln is about us, who we are. In the April 13th Newsweek of last year, editor John Meekham argued that Americans, quote, value individual freedom and free or largely free enterprise. The foundational documents are the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Now, without probably knowing it or certainly not acknowledging it, Meekham was explaining I think, why Americans will always be interested in Lincoln. Lincoln proclaimed early in 1865 that the Emancipation Proclamation was, quote, the central act of my administration and the great event of the 19th century. I hate to disagree with Lincoln, but I think it was not, and I'll explain why briefly. It was Lincoln's understanding, I think, of liberty that became the greatest legacy of the age. He revolutionized personal freedom in the United States. He assured that the principle of personal liberty was protected by law, even incorporated into the Constitution. Thus, Lincoln elevated the Founding Fathers and Andrew Jackson's more restricted vision into a universal one. Basically, I argue Lincoln inserted what I argue is our mission statement, that is the Declaration of Independence, into the rule book, that is the Constitution of the United States. Part of the legacy of Lincoln, especially his new birth of freedom, involves a redefinition of the role of government in securing liberty. Prior to the Civil War amendments, that is the 13th, 14th, and 15th, we the people wanted freedom from government. Government shall not abridge the freedom of speech or assembly. The Bill of Rights were protection from the federal government. Now the amendment stated Congress shall have the power to enforce certain rights of citizenship, such as the right to vote. In other words, it becomes positive liberty. So liberty and freedom are the interpretive uh, centerpieces, the thesis of the age of Lincoln. And I think told as a story of freedoms and liberty, rather than the slave's emancipation, the 19th century makes a much greater sense. If you take emancipation and you do a line, what scholars call a typology, at one end you put total unfreedom, at the other end total freedom, and you place emancipation on that line, I think we can see where emancipation fits. And thus, one of the arguments is the book. We see the need and importance of a meaningful vote. A meaningful vote in a democracy and a republic defines citizenship and belonging in a democracy. It did in the Young Republic in 1793. It certainly did in 1865 67, and certainly today. One scholar has found 500 ideas. He doesn't call them definitions, but he calls them ideas of liberty and freedom. So what freedom meant to an enslaved person on a plantation in Louisiana was meant something very different for that white owner of a human being as property, or even the overseer saw it. It also was quite different, liberty and freedom, in meanings for a young woman or a young boy sewing soles on the bottom of shoes in a New England factory. And certainly it meant something different in the northeast or northwest of a yeoman farmer in Mississippi or Indiana. Thus, both Union and Confederate soldiers understood the war as a war about freedom and liberty. And you can look at their letters, you can look at their diary, and both Confederate and Union soldiers say they're fighting for liberty and freedom. But they define those terms differently and they meant something very differently. Lincoln often spoke about the differences between two antagonistic groups who, quote, declare for liberty. Some, he said, used the word liberty to mean that each man could, quote, do as he pleases with himself and the product of his labor. Others held the word liberty to mean, quote, for some men to do as they please with other men and the product of other men's labor. He proffered a parable to nail the point. Quote, the shepherd drives the wolf from the sheep's throat, he said, for which the sheep thanks the shepherd as a liberator, while the wolf denounced him for the same act 
as a destroyer of liberty, especially as a sheep is a black one. Now, secondly, I center religion in the age of Lincoln. Argue that Lincoln was not only the greatest president, but the greatest theologian of the 19th century. In order to understand succession, to understand how men thought about dying in the Civil War, and why women would send their sons and husbands off to die, as well as to understand the 19th century, I think one has to understand how religion was interwoven into the very culture and thinking of American society at the time. I've never understood why historians took so long to figure out that religion was important or motivational. It was the only thing in the world that I know of that people would give up water for, food for, uh, sleep for, uh, their life for, even sex, and we don't think it motivated people. Anyway, the age of Lincoln opens with the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln's Benediction, as I see it. The first chapter begins with Baptist minister William Miller, who on October the 22nd, 1844, predicted, of course, the return of Jesus Christ to earth that day. People gave up everything they had, put on their finest clothes. Some got on the roof of their homes and waited for Christ to come. They should have been a little more aware because this was the second time that Miller had actually predicted it. But I sort of use it as a literary trope when, in fact, Christ does not return. I argue these people, it may not have been specifically them, but people in American society went back to their old life, went back into society, and with a different kind of faith, tried to make the United States into God's kingdom to help bring on the millennium. Evangelist, abolitionist, the president of Oberlin College, Charles Grandison Finney, uh, part of the Great Second Awakening, argued that the great business of the church is to, quote, reform the world, to put away every kind of sin. Christians, he believed, were, quote, bound to exert their influence to secure a legislation that is in accordance with the law of God. And that was not in yesterday's paper that was actually written. The age of Lincoln was a time of millennialism. The radical belief that Americans, God's chosen people, could expedite the reign of Christ on earth by living piously and remaking society according to God's will. In the 19th century, religious fanaticism, north and south, strongly influenced events. In order to perfect society of the United States, reformers attacked various evils that they saw. Temperance societies attacked alcohol. Abraham Lincoln was president of the Springfield Temperance Society. Uh, women demanded their rights. Prison and school reforms. Utopian societies endorsing no sex, lots of sex, or simply eating graham crackers. Splattered across the United States like a shotgun pattern as reformers tried to eradicate evil. Eventually in the North, most reform efforts lined up to declare slavery as the single greatest evil in the country. Now, abolition was always a minority position in the North, but it rose to prominence in the 1850s. Many Northerners believed that the United States was to be a society ordained by God to become the utopia that would bring on the millennium. The evil of slavery had to be eradicated. Now, these same reform movements, even some abolitionism, not as much, were also active, though, much less so in the South. But in the South, many slaveholders believed, and I don't think we've understood this well enough, that patriarchal plantation society, as they imagine, the key word is imagine, not as it was, but as they imagine the South to be, based on slavery, with its ordered hierarchy, with a place for everyone, was a utopia and ordained by God. They were arguing that slavery was fit not just for the South, not just for African Americans, but for all societies and all workers, and that slavery would help bring on the millennium. So, religious fanatics in the North and the South were sure they knew what God's will was, and they thought they were doing God's will, and when you think you're doing God's will, you're not about to compromise. Lincoln had a very different understanding of God than most of the people of his period. While everyone else knew God's will, Lincoln knew we cannot understand God's will. Although he came to see himself as part of God's plan for human history, he could not be certain what God's plan was. Even with the outcome determined, Lincoln would still qualify if God now wills. And I challenge you to find where Lincoln ever playing something God's will is always in the subjunctive if. Lincoln read the Bible in the Jewish tradition of reading the Old Testament, understanding God and people in a corporate sense, not the individual salvation of the dominant Protestant evangelicals grown out of the Second Great Awakening. Interestingly, this corporate understanding of God using his people to work out his will in history is also the African-American theological perspective. 
Thus, while the Civil War caused a theological crisis for both white Northerners and white Southerners, it did not for African Americans. The Civil War and the early developments of Reconstruction was the fulfilling of God's plan to free his people from slavery in the United States and to punish those pharaohs of the South. It all made sense from this theological perspective. Now, I am uh, going to, uh, and I skipped already, I should mention one of the points I'm going I'm to do when I talked about liberty, I think it's very important, one of the major points of the book, and I'm not going to spend any time on it, is that this liberty and democracy are developing along with capitalism. And in fact, I give the example, for 20-something years, I had taught Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harris Beecher Stowe, who incidentally was no abolitionist, she was a colonizationist, just like Lincoln, and later moves to Florida in the South and, and has this real wonderful story about the Southern people there and things. Uh, but as I was working on this book and I reread Uncle Tom's Cabin, I realized it is not only what I had used it for, an indictment of slavery, but it's also, and probably as much so, if not more, an indictment of greed in American capitalism, in the American system. And as I look back, the most popular literature of that period all had this theme, uh, which I, I think was critical. People read their history then of Lincoln's generation, and they knew that every attempt to have a republic or a democracy had started off well, and then they argued as people got wealthy and wealth dis disparities become, then in fact democracies and attempts at republics had crumbled. And this was actually more, in many ways than slavery, the great concern of whether in fact uh, democracy in the United States would survive. So just remember that. If we have time for discussion, we can go into it. But I think it's, it's very important to put liberty and democracy in the context of what many saw as an unfettered uh, capitalism and its development at the same time and the concern how that would work with democracy. Well, the, the third thing I emphasize is the importance of seeing Abraham Lincoln as a Southerner he was and how that influenced history and particularly the Civil War and then America itself. This is probably one of the most controversial arguments in the book, but I do feel good about one thing. When I argued that Lincoln was a Southerner, people in Illinois got very angry with me. Then I went down to South Carolina, and white Southerners were even more angry with me. So I felt I had finally done a good thing and united this hostility between two antagonistic groups to somebody else and did a good. Uh, now I have a long hour's talk on Lincoln as a Southerner, so I, I just quickly touch on some of these things. There were two kinds of Southerners who migrated, in fact, into the areas of southern Illinois, southern Ohio, southern Indiana. There were those like Thomas Lincoln, Lincoln's father, who hated slavery uh, and wanted to get away from slavery. Others, though, and I fear the great majority, wanted to get away from African Americans and black people. And they were not the best on race relations. And you need to understand this if you want to understand the Lincoln-Douglas debates and what politics were like. And also, what I will argue, the huge shift and change in the Midwest, including Iowa, from one in which uh, free African Americans were not allowed to come to one in which Iowa takes the lead uh, in terms of black citizenship and, and voting to give black uh, males the vote. Uh, and I think that's part of the idealism that comes out of the Civil War we often, we often miss. Uh, so many Southerners actually migrated what became Lincoln's adopted hometown that the first name of Springfield, Illinois was Calhoun, named after John C. Calhoun, the politician most associated with slavery and in introducing the positive good argument into Congress and the nation, the, the very thing that turned Lincoln uh, into so adamant of getting rid of slavery. As long as slavery was seen as a necessary evil, Lincoln and many could live with it. But when it becomes a positive good, the argument goes on, it changes directly. Well, I argue that Lincoln's Southern habits went beyond turns of speech, story storytelling, and literary references, preferences for plump Southern bales or indulgent child-rearing practices. Critical to his life decisions and as to his handling of the crisis to come was Lincoln's understanding of and respect for Southern honor. This projection of Lincoln as a Southern is more than a simple mind game. Lincoln's very yeoman Southernness contributed to his defense of the Union against what he saw as a cabal of slaveholding oligarchs. For Lincoln, it was more than just the preservation of union. It was also a matter of honor. As he told the committee 
from Baltimore, the YMCA that came to him and said, let them go. Let South Carolina go. Anything's better than war, the horrors of war. And this is Lincoln's quote, and I can give you about 40 others about honor. He says, you would have me break my oath and surrender the government without a blow? There is no Washington in that, no Jackson in that, no manhood nor honor in that. Uh, in fact, I argue, in fact, it was only Lincoln, uh, his reliance of, on the rule of law with this southern honor that would not allow the South to go. Even William Seward, who was seen as the most radical, was willing to let them go anything to avoid war. So I think it's important. Well, also, I've never separated the separation of Reconstruction from the Civil War or the traditional dating of the end of Reconstruction. I think we've made a mistake. We bookended American history, so the Civil War closed out one era of our history. Reconstruction begins the next period or second half of American history. And yet, Reconstruction is part and parcel of the Civil War. I see it as the long Civil War. The Reconstruction has to be considered as part of the Civil War. Uh, historians also usually argue that Reconstruction ends with the withdrawal of federal troops from the former Confederate states in 1877, but that's not how people lived their lives at the time. The gains of freedom during Reconstruction were not legally undone until sanctioned by the Supreme Court in Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896, and those former Confederate state constitutions of the 1890s and earliest 20th century uh, disfranchise and bring in segregation legally. So the age of Lincoln coincides with his millennialist impulse in politics as well as religion. One I see ending with the 1896 presidential third party campaign. The populists were really the last political party to advocate for African American rights and equality based on Lincoln's rule of law until the modern civil rights movement. Well, at stake during the Civil War is the very existence of the United States. It's the bloodiest war in our history. The Civil War also posed in a crucial way what clearly became persistent themes in American history, the character of the nation and the fate of African Americans. I think you can read that in a larger way. That is, what is the place of minorities or at least people perceived to be different in a democracy? Something that we might think of as pluralism today. Consequently, scholars have been vitally interested in the Civil War, searching out clues therein for the very identity of America. But we might have been looking in the wrong place. If the identity of America is in the Civil War, I think the meaning of America, or what we become, and how we do things is actually found in Reconstruction. I got a lot of teasing from a, a number of my friends. The first book I published in my father's house or many mansions was highly quantitative, a community study. And somebody said, well, Vernon, I wasn't sure how good a historian you were, but I thought you at least could count. Don't you know that Lincoln died in 1865 and you're still writing about him, you know, in, 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 in the uh, 1990 and uh, up and uh, 1910 and 20? And I think, though, that's a contribution to the book to figure out what happened with these ideas and things that Lincoln un unleashed. To blend all these strands of the 19th century history and present it as a piece, the age of Lincoln then uses Abraham Lincoln as a fulcrum to put together the story of sectional conflict, Civil War, and Reconstruction. The very formation of Lincoln's ideas before the Civil War, his leadership and development of his thinking during the Civil War, and then importantly, how those ideas played out for good and bad in the years, years following the Civil War and our own modern America, and that sets the organization of the story. During Reconstruction, Former Confederate generals led terrorist group with many former Confederates. But I found men in 1877, 1878, and 1876 who had not fought in the Civil War, who were too young, but they were riding under these former Confederate generals. And they fought in these terrorist paramilitary groups. Now, as you know, I'm sure that over 40%, when our budgets in the U.S. got going, um, like they are now. I mean, one of the differences, Lincoln was able to pay for this war, but the war we've had now, we haven't been paying for it. It contributed to the huge deficit that we had. But the largest part of our budget after the Civil War, by far, almost a, major, almost a half of it, went to Civil War veterans from the Union and their widows and, and orphans. Now, of course, the Confederates were, uh, were not covered under this for logic, good logic, it seems to me. Uh, but each state set up a Confederate veterans benefits. And I found these men who had not fought in the Civil War as late as 1878 applying for Civil War veterans benefit having read with these terrorist paramilitary uh, groups. To me, that's good intent evidence of these people saw 
Reconstruction and the terrorism that went with it as part of the Civil War. It makes you wonder who really won then if you look at it that way. Yet it's important to remember, I think, too, that most whites in the South were not part of these counter-revolutionary terrorist organizations. The Ku Klux Klan is just the most familiar. There are many others. The tragedy was that most good people just did nothing and did not stand up for a bedrock of Lincoln's philosophy. That is the rule of law. But that should not obscure just how many white Southerners actually fought for the Union in the Civil War. Now, one of my favorite illustrations in the book, and you really don't have to buy the book, all the illustrations and many more on the website and go see it, though, is this one. Whites, if you don't want to help my grandchildren. Uh, <laughs> white Southerners who commanded Union troops. Of course, my favorite is Abraham Lincoln in the center and others. And the bottom corner, of course, is John C. Fremont who was the first Republican candidate, much more radical than Lincoln, that Lincoln had to rein in after he, in fact, uh, in Missouri, set all the slaves free, uh, an early emancipation proclamation. Where is Fremont from? He's born in Savannah, Georgia. Where did he grow up? Grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, and graduated from the College of Charleston. And you can go on and on with stories like that. I think what you see is a real civil sport war. If you add up, all of the Southerners, white Southerners, that fought for the Union, every single state except South Carolina actually had a regiment, and those from South Carolina went and joined with North Carolina and Tennessee and other places. And then you add that critical element that many think really shifted the balance, that is the 180,000 to 200,000 Southerners who were black that fought for the Union, you get a real sense of the Civil War, not to count also what I would call those cultural Southerners from Kentucky, Missouri, Southern Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana. It's a different way of thinking about the Civil War and Southerners, particularly if you think, as I have argued, that Lincoln himself came out of this Southern tradition. Although we're finally moving away from Gone with the Wind and Birth of a Nation mythology about the antebellum period in slavery, in the popular culture, the view of an overreaching and doomed Reconstruction still predominates. Now, when I studied the Civil War in 1969 at Preston with Jim McPherson, Historians were not talking about contention in the Civil War. And somehow it made the Confederacy, I think, even seem more noble. They couldn't win, but they fought anyway. They, we sort of like that story in America, the underdog who fights for what they believe in, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, like that, uh, but knowing they couldn't win. But with Vietnam, that view changed. Historians now, in fact, grant contention in the Civil War, arguing there were moments and times the Confederacy could have won and probably should have won. Uh, I start one of the two military chapters uh, as late as 1864. I agree with Lincoln. Lincoln thought he would lose the election of 1864. And I think he's right. Uh, until, in fact, uh, Sherman took Atlanta and then marched to the sea and Savannah. And that shifted the public opinion and the election. Uh, and this chapter called The Giant Holocaust of Death begins with Jefferson Davis' replacement of General Joe Johnson with John Bell Hood. Now, Hood was brave. He sort of reminds me of that night, if any of you remember in Monty Python, that they keep chopping him off and his arms and his leg, and he keeps coming. Well, that was John Bell Hood. He was extraordinarily, I mean, he'd, he'd already, you know, had a Comanche error in one end. He loses an arm, he loses a leg, and he just keeps, keeps charging. Uh, Robert E. Lee said he was too much the lion and not enough the fox. So I don't question his bravery. But I think a lot of Lincoln's re-election and the end of slavery comes about because of Hood at that moment. Uh, it would have been a very different outcome, I think. Uh, I follow different people in this book, and one of them was a young seminarian from Wheaton, Illinois, and he doesn't like Sherman when he first comes on as a commander. He's a real goody-goody two-shoe. He's always upset about the boys drinking, the camp followers playing cards, and all of this sort of thing. But nothing like success, I think, comes about to change people's mind. And by the end of the war, like most of the troops, he was Uncle Billy. They loved Sherman marching with him. But he wrote to his, his mother about Sherman. He said, don't worry, Mom. Sherman will never go to hell. He'll outflank the devil yet. Uh, and that was because when he took on Joe Johnston, who, who was a, a very, very good military strategist, he and Longstreet understood that you make the enemy come to you, particularly if you have fewer numbers with defensive numbers. Sherman attacked him outside of Atlanta, good ways out. Sherman lost over 3,000 troops, and, and Johnston loses less than, than two dozen. Uh, and that all changes. So contingency. I'm often asked if Lincoln had not been killed, what would have happened? 
My own favorite example is Civil War hero Robert Smalls. How many of you know Robert Smalls, the black hero from Charleston, South Carolina, steals the planter, uh, the ship, later becomes a congressman, and a major, major leader. And I, I think there's going to be, I just met the man who did Seabiscuit, the, the producer in uh, Pleasantville. He's very interested in Robert Smalls and maybe doing a movie about him. That's the best way. People don't learn their history from books like The Age of Lincoln. They learn it from movies. Or more important, they learn it what you tell them is important, like your monuments and things like that. So I think it's wonderful that you have an underground railroad house, you know, near here and thing. I think it's much better than in my hometown. They have a monument to Preston Brooks for Kane and Charles Sumner. Now that made great football teams because every little boy knew the way to get to be, you know, um, uh, celebrated in your community was to beat the fire to somebody while he's sitting down. It made us mean, but we learn our history in those ways, I think. Well, and I'm hoping we do some, some recognitions of Small like that. 1862, Lincoln met for an over an hour with Robert Smalls. And he asked Robert Smalls why he risked his life and his family's and his men to steal the vessel of the planter from the Confederacy in Charleston Harbor and deliver it to the Union. Small's one-word answer was freedom, which dovetailed with Lincoln's own new birth of freedom, as he would express the next year in his Gettysburg Address. Robert Small's campaign for Lincoln's re-election in 1864 and greatly admired and respected the president. And Small was one of several African Americans that Abe Lincoln had met with while he was president and who helped Lincoln advance on his thinking of race. When Abraham Lincoln was invited to participate in raising the United States flag over Fort Sumter on April 14, 1865, four years to the day the flag had been struck, he was advised and convinced it would be too dangerous for him to travel to South Carolina. Ironically, Lincoln would have been on the planter with Robert Smalls. I'm convinced because Smalls and bodyguards would have been protecting the president of South Carolina, Lincoln would not have been killed on April 14 if he had been at Fort Sumter instead of Fort Theater. When Robert Small heard of the news of Booth's assassination of Lincoln, the former slave exclaimed, Lord, have mercy on us all. And I like to tell people he cried because, you know, if you look at Lincoln and read it, he's nothing but a big crybaby. He's crying and sobbing all the time. It was not unmasculine for men to cry at that time. The bravest men, like there was no one braver than Robert Smalls, uh, how we've changed our ideas of masculinity over time to one showing their emotions. But his stories have not been willing to grant contingency the story of Reconstruction. So my interpretation of Reconstruction highlights its successes as an interracial democracy on the local level where new grassroots alliance flourished. Even more importantly, I point out the number of Southern whites who actually went against the grain and actually cooperated with and supported interracial democracy during Reconstruction. A number of former Confederate heroes and prominent white Southerners supported black rights. People know that James Longstreet was blamed for Gettysburg for years because he became a Republican. And whereas he once had commanded Confederate troops in New Orleans, he commanded former slaves, former Confederates, and former Union soldiers against these paramilitary terrorist groups. Beauregard, who remained a Democrat, supported black rights. When I was a boy, there was a TV show on called The Gray Ghost. It was about John Mosby, the Confederate raider and all the sort of heroic things he did during the Civil War. But nobody got around to tell us that after the Civil War, he supported black rights and uh, became a Republican and supported interracial democracy. The very governor who hung John Brown, uh, Wise, who was also the governor of Virginia, also uh, was a general in the Confederate Army, becomes a Republican, supports black rights. And his son was a Confederate major, became one of the great civil rights attorneys of the late 19th and 20th century. And you can go full circle, I think, to 1909 and the founding of the NACP, which actually included white Southerners at that time. So I've tried to reframe Reconstruction after If Reconstruction was such a failure, why did Southern whites have to use terrorism, fraud, and violence to overthrow a legitimate uh, legal government? I'm going to have to cut short a little bit, but I want to just mention there are two contradictory legacies that come arose from the Civil War and come out of it. Hatred, which we've talked about a good bit, but also idealism, this idealism of interracial democracy in the South that we haven't known enough about, especially in race relations. I think we have to understand both of them. And although historians have misunderstood Reconstruction in the South, they've hardly paid attention to Reconstruction in the North. This, I talked earlier, the Midwest had been extremely racist before the Civil War. Lincoln was totally embarrassed by some of the things Illinois did during the Civil War. But Lincoln's legacy was called upon to change that racism as when Ulysses Grant called Iowa that bright, radical star because they extended, the first state to extend suggestions to African-American male outside the defeated Confederate after initiatives had failed in Connecticut, Ohio, and a number of other places. And I don't think this idealism dies out initially either. 
especially, I think, is evident in the Midwest. Uh, when the civil rights cases of 1883 struck down the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and 1884 in Ohio versus California, the court ruled that the 14th Amendment did not guarantee enforcement of the Bill of Rights. States led by the Midwest passed their own state civil rights statutes. Iowa was the first with Ohio in 1884, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Nebraska, 1885, Pennsylvania did in 1889. And I think it's also, at least to me, interesting that the great migration, in fact, of African Americans to the Midwest and to these cities like Chicago and Indianapolis, I don't think it's just for jobs. We know it was economic motivated, but I think it's also that the law is there, even if it's not being implemented, it's not being followed, there is the law, the rule of law, that there is equality, they can vote, and by following that, it gives them the opportunity. Uh, and I think that's something we've often, you know, not paid attention to like we should. Now, the age of Lincoln has left us with troublesome questions that we do not want to face, questions of race tear at the fabric of our supposedly egalitarian society, at our system of justice and law and order. As Attorney General Eric Holder reminded us in what became a controversial statement, quote, in things racial we have always been and I believe continue to be in too many ways essentially a nation of cowards. Just as the Civil War cannot be separated from Reconstruction any more than the sexual conflict and events that result in conflict can be separated from Lincoln and the war, I'm going to step out on a limb and argue the election of President Barack Obama cannot be separated from the Civil War, Lincoln, and Reconstruction. Now some see Obama's election, or more correctly they argue, that the election of a black man is fulfillment of Lincoln, the completion of Reconstruction, and the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Some argue race as a distinct problem in American life has been resolved by Obama. I was asked by NPR, for instance, to comment on this for a North Carolina voting rights case that came down. Chicago Tribune in March 15th said, quote, does the election of a black man mean racism is no longer a factor in American politics? And are civil rights laws outdated in the age of Obama? The article was discussing legal briefs filed in the Supreme Court case reported that Obama's election heralds the emergence of a colorblind society in which special legal safeguards for minorities are no longer required. Stephen Colbert in the Colbert Report on March 16, 2009 said that rewriting history is a good thing because we can make it better. <laughs> he recommends that now that an African American is president, we can say that slavery never existed. Now, although done in humor, there are indications that in the court of popular opinion, as well as with some justice of the United States, this is to some degree happening. Now, writing and rewriting history reminds me of an interesting playwright, Pulitzer Prize winner, and recipient of MacArthur Jr. Grant, African-American Susan Laurie Parks, is fascinated by the story of Lincoln, or to be more specific, by the death of Lincoln. Park writes about a grave digger, the son of grave diggers, digging the huge hole of history. History summoned this digger like a memory, and in his big hole he made a theme park where he reconstructed history. His favorite reconstruction was of Abraham Lincoln. Tall and thin, he resembles Lincoln, and he puts on a fake wart. People pronounce him and Lincoln to be in, quote, virtual twinship. Someone told him that he played Lincoln so well that he ought to be shot. And after that, his money-making endeavor was to sit still while Pay and Custer chose the pistol and shot him in the back of the head with blanks, of course. They would shout, thus to the tyrants, or the South is avenged, or the assorted remarks such as Robert E. Lee's last words strike the tent. One of her insights into Lincoln was the idea of uncertainty amid a grander, millennial, almost mystical vision of freedom when Lincoln, quote, didn't know if the war was right, when it could be said he didn't always know which side he was on, not because he was a stupid man, because it was sometimes not two different sides at all, but one great side surging towards something beyond either northern or southerners. Parks remind us, I think, of how Americans identify with Lincoln in different ways, how so many of us, and especially historians, write ourselves into whom we make Lincoln to be. It's no coincidence, I think, that argue Lincoln is a southerner and not only the greatest president, but the greatest theologian. Often it's our better angels and sometimes our greatest fears and fantasies. Parks' play also suggests a changing image of Lincoln among African Americans, from the great emancipator, in fact, to the great white honky. At a session just two falls ago, when my book came out, at the Association of the Study of African American History and Life, every African American scholar younger than I could not say anything good about Lincoln. This is where they sat around and, and everyone told me where my book was wrong. Uh, and uh, I was the only non-African-American there. 
those African Americans my age and, and older, many of them wanted, I think, to defend Lincoln, but it was like going against a, a new creed to come out. Uh, you saw some of this if you saw the PBS documentary by Henry Louis Gates. I think he very well captured the ambiguity and change of the image of Lincoln. The shift in views of Lincoln came about with the modern civil rights movement, correctly labeled the Second Reconstruction. In the public sphere, Stokely Carmichael attacked Lincoln as a racist. Lerone Bennett, a friend of mine, longtime editor of Ebony, published a, a, an article about 1969, becomes forced into glory 2000. With the civil rights movement, when historians' interest shifted from slavery to race and racism, Lincoln's more gradualist policy was seen as inadequate. One historian characterized Lincoln then as the perfect embodiment of northern racism. Uh, I'm part of a whole generation of historians, early social historians, who we sort of did away with the idea of heroes. Part because we were social historians, we were not interested in, quote, the great white men that had dominated American history. In my own field of Southern history, I'm fond of saying how those Confederates like Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, Nathan Bedford Forrest, and Jefferson Davis had turned the South prematurely great. That's a joke. No one ever gets, oh well. We were eager to show that our national monuments were too often constructed of clay. On reflection, I think it's good to understand that heroes are people just like us <coughs> with their good and bad qualities and often their own personal demons. We need to understand that leaders like Lincoln were flawed, but we also have to judge them by their own time and place. Like most people in the 19th century, Lincoln used the N-word and told racist jokes. Now that does not mean that we should not value his heroic characteristics and efforts. In 1864, a delegation of African American men came to see Lincoln to request equal pay for uh, black laborers equal to what whites got. Henry Samuels remembered the event, wrote it down, and he said, Lincoln listened quietly. Then according to Samuels, Lincoln said, and he was a great storyteller and loved to tell jokes, in a jocular manner, quote, well, gentlemen, you wish the pay of Cuffy raised. Well, the story does not end there with that patronizing tone of Lincoln. This young black man, Samuels, boldly confronted the president that they did not make use of the word Cuffy in their vernacular. But they were there to request, quote, the wages of the American colored laborer be equalized with those of the American white laborer. Lincoln apologized. He told Samuels, I quote, I stand corrected, young man, but you know, I am by birth a southerner, and I section the term is plied without any idea of an offensive nature. But unlike so many others, Lincoln got the idea. Lincoln went on to say that he would at the very earliest possible moment do all in my power to accede to your request. Wages were equalized only a month later. This and other corroborating evidence have shown Lincoln's incredible flexible mind allowed him to grow so that by the end of the war he was leading the nation to a better place on race. One way to put Lincoln's racism into a historical context is a comparison between Lincoln and the major political figure of the day who was not Lincoln but who was Stephen A. Douglas, the senator and leader of the little giant from Illinois. Douglas was much more in line with the rest of white America, north and south. It's important to compare Lincoln to Douglas because it offers quite a different perspective, and only by talking about Stephen Douglas' advocation for white supremacy and his use of the race card to mobilize voters can we appreciate where Lincoln was on race. I'm amazed when I ask students what they know about the Lincoln-Douglas debate. They'll tell me, well, the Lincoln was this tall dude, six foot four, and Douglas, this short, squat little fellow looks like you. Uh, you know, who cares? What is important is that Lincoln and Douglas were debating two visions of America. And if you had to bet at the time, you would think Douglas had the upper hand on this. Stephen Douglas was the most dynamic politician of his age. He was a leading light of the Democratic Party, and he stood blatantly for white supremacy. When he found out that Abraham Lincoln was going to be his opponent in the 1858 election, he immediately started discrediting Abraham Lincoln. He said that his house divided speech was a call for civil war. And Lincoln responded to this uh, the next night in Chicago in June of 1858. Lincoln denied Douglas' assertion that the United States government was, quote, made by the white man for the benefit of the white man to be administered by the white men. Lincoln threw caution to the wind. He claimed remarkable privilege for the Declaration of Independence and its implication about race and equality. I have only to say, let us discard all this quibbling about this man and the other man, this race and that race, and the other race being inferior, and therefore they must be placed in an inferior position. Let us discard all these things and unite as one people throughout this land until we shall once more stand up declaring that all men are created equal. 
Now, Douglas promptly turned this back on Lincoln, indignantly proclaiming, quote, the Chicago Doctrine of Lincoln's declaring that the Negro and the white man are made equal by the Declaration of Independence and by divine providence is a monstrous heresy. Actually, Douglas and Lincoln both understood that no man who declared equality for blacks could be elected to a statewide office in Illinois. Republicans advised Lincoln to back away from his quarrel for equality, and Lincoln did. In his fourth debate at Charleston, near where his father had moved and was buried, and his widowed stepmother still lived, Lincoln made statements that still haunt today. In his meanest pronouncement on race, he denied that he favored civil rights for African Americans. Yet he kept his ground in declaring the Declaration of Independence included all men in his claim for natural rights. Douglas's plan of attack was to make certain voters understood that those natural rights inevitably led to civil rights. Then in the last three debates, Lincoln went on the offense and became bolder on African American rights. In Alton, the second most southerly location of the debates, Lincoln eloquently cast slavery as a moral issue. As Lincoln grew in his presidency, he came to see emancipation as a war issue and a justice issue. And yet Abraham Lincoln was killed not for the Emancipation Proclamation, but for advocating African American voting as limited as that was. On April 11th, when Lincoln gave his last speech, one man in the audience understood perfectly what Lincoln was speaking about. John Wilkes Booth told his commander, and that means he used the N-word citizenship. Now, by God, I'll put him through. That's the last speech he will ever make. Hence, Lincoln is part of a long list of martyrs who died for black voting rights. Uh, thus, Lincoln's legacy, I think, continues to reverberate in strange and interesting ways. I'm hoping that with President Obama's identification with Lincoln as a leader, or at least the parallels created by the campaign and the media, we will see more willingness from Lincoln's critics to accept the good with the bad, to understand the context of the 19th century, the ambiguity of individuals and of humanity itself. I just want to conclude with the conclusion of my book. Lincoln recast America's purpose, and his call for a new birth of freedom came to fruition in new amendments to the Constitution, none of which was inevitable, all of which promised to embrace an equality of opportunity that transcended any particular and exclusionary right. Under rulings that tout as separate but equal, the U.S. Supreme Court put to rest those millennial schemes of equality. Nevertheless, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments would continue to promise freedom from slavery, equal protection of the law, and the right to vote. Even as the darkness of the nadir began to settle over the land, a handful of believing blacks and a, similar number, and a smaller number still of trusting whites put their faith in the law and continued to work on redrawing freedom's boundaries. In the past of the age, Americans gave up old dreams of heavenly perfection and enshrined new hopes of material progress, incremental, tangible, calculables in dollars and dimes, full bellies and fine clothes. In place of noble statesmen and great leaders, they trumpeted clean hands and efficient administration. In place of pure hearts, gentle spirits, and feminized consciences, they held up manly toil, stoic endurance, and the virtue of struggling self-interest. But in the American mind, the Civil War itself never truly ended. It was transmuted to a romantic memory, the stuff of elaborate weekend rituals of bloodless battles during which no contraband crossed enemy lines at risk of life. It flowered into a national pastime for vacationing families that took in the emotional majesty of Little Round Top and Cemetery Ridge without making sure to wrestle likewise with untold lynchings across America. Whether found in the shock of a geneticist discovering slaves in one's family or in the waste of New Orleans' devastated Ninth Ward, the war is with us still as myth and reality both. Just as in the age of Lincoln, moral choice, democratic citizenship, and equality still mingle. Determine the thing that can and shall be done, wrote Lincoln, and then we shall find the way. Thank you. I'd love to take questions. Feel free. You cannot hurt my feelings. I have five daughters. Uh, little girls uh, adore their fathers. They think their dads can walk on water until the individual daughter becomes 13, 14, 12, depend. then suddenly daddies can't swim anymore, though they're doing the same thing. So uh, honestly, I do believe history's an interpretation. Feel free to disagree. I should have said enough to upset somebody, at least, or a couple of people. Just the opposite, and, and you would have thought so because he is a Westerner. I say he's a Southerner, but can tell you his grandfather is killed, in fact, by a Native American that attacked their home. 
uh, in uh, Kentucky, and almost almost his father as it would have been no Abraham Lincoln. So you would have thought so because of this feeling of it. But just the opposite. In the Black Hawk War, an old uh, Native American wanders into camp. He's not one of the, the, the warring trials. He's just an old man and not part of that trial. And actually, this is a rough bunch of boys. There's a lot of stories in the book that, that Lincoln becomes a captain of. He actually says it's the greatest honor he ever had in his autobiography. Of course, he hadn't been elected president, but in 1859 when he wrote it with this, this group of Clary Grove boys, pretty rough fellows, and they decide they're going to probably kill the Native American. At least they're going to beat him up. And Lincoln, who had wrestled and all this, was a great athlete. People miss this about Lincoln. He stands in front of him and says, you'll have to, you know, kill me first, go through me first, and challenges him to stop it. The best example is the Sioux Uprising in Minnesota, where, in fact, um, uh, the Native Americans go, and there's a, a, some killing and other things, and the, the general in charge there uh, in the state is literally going to execute all of the people. They have about 200 there. Lincoln took the time and read through, when he's president of the United States, reads through every single case. And I've forgotten how many, but it's no more than 19. I can't remember any. And then one check, and he lets all, unless it, unless it can be proved that they actually murdered or raped, he literally, you know, says you do it. And he's told, he says, if you do that, you will not win Minnesota. You'll lose this election. He says, I could not, you know, in good conscience, win an election, the president, over the lives of innocent people. So, uh, you know, much better than most in terms of his relationship with Native America. Lincoln was amazing this way when you think about it. As I said, uh, there was so much this kind of hatred that went on, and if anyone you would have thought would have had this sort of feeling, would have been with his own family history, but he didn't. There was this way about immigrants and others, too. One of the famous quotes is when he says he may as well go to Russia because when they start saying that they are not going to allow black men to be there, and then they're Irish and the Italians, and the next, he says you may as well live in a despotism. He really believed in opportunity. Now, that's different than equality, but people should be able to rise on their own ability and work, and nothing should stand in their way if they're willing to work hard and do it. Did that answer? It's complicated. There are a couple of books on I can recommend for you. In fact, they're on the website. Yes, sir. And he was a pretty good political strategist on that. And then when Sherman was successful in Atlanta, Georgia, that was kind of the tie turn the election. Uh, would you agree with that uh, point of view? Yes, and I, I meant to say that. I was probably confused when I was talking about John Bell Hood. That was what changed it when they replaced Johnston. I think that Sherman probably would not have been able to take Atlanta, certainly not by the time of the election, uh, and, and made the difference. Uh, what Sherman did was incredible, incredibly radical and also uh, changed the nature of war. And I talk about the age of Lincoln a little bit before there, when he and Sheridan, same, same sort of thinking, are out west. They talk about we use these same strategies uh, against the white southerners. That is, you hit the civilian population, and that's how you're going to wipe out. And they actually make that comparison. And that's what I think Lincoln and Grant both didn't like. And it was also radical militarily that you just cut your lines and march uh, forward, forging off the land. Uh, and yet Lincoln, when he found generals who understood that the North had more men, he, he honestly believed that the sooner the war was over, you'd lose less men, even though it was horrible blood, bloodletting and just charging forward like Grant did, and, and sometimes Sherman, uh, not as much that still that would save lives in the long run. It's just almost like the question, I was, you were talking about dropping the bomb, I think, and that was part of this queasiness about, about Lincoln, but taking it to civilians was not something either one felt comfortable with, but it certainly became the strategy, and it changed the, uh, the war. It probably had the different effect than Sherman thought, which would make the, the Confederates then want to give up. I think it made them so angry that they still haven't given up. 
uh, by taking civilians. I'm serious. I'm being a little funny. But I really think so. It changed the nature of the war. It doesn't work like that, I think. Uh, same thing happened to Native Americans, but they thought it would in that terms. Did I answer both your questions? Okay. I can talk forever on this. Now, I, I want to... Did you hear the question about Lincoln seem like a religious man? I think we'll never know. Uh, you know, the major atheist society has Lincoln as its masthead, too. I mean, everybody claims Lincoln. You know, the Baptist, because his father was a hard-shell Baptist, and that's where I think Lincoln really did get his anti-slavery feelings. Uh, he went to church with, the, with his wife and sat in the Presbyterian church there, and Presbyterians claim him. Uh, his wife probably knew better than anybody when she said he was not uh, Christian in the orthodox, in an orthodox way. And it's very complex. Uh, I have my own strong feelings, and I think I'm right. I think I make a good totality assertion. But you should know that most historians probably don't feel this way. A couple of others have come along since. My friend Ron White, who was in graduate school with me at Princeton, has written a book now that makes a very similar argument. I just wonder if we just read the same things. Uh, but as you know, when Lincoln was young, and this is often used to show why Lincoln is not religious, his dad made him go to church. I think he would have gone anyway, but it was a fundamentalist, very emotional kind of, and he did not like that kind of religion. It's not him. And afterwards, he would go out and mimic the minister with the children and other kids and, and you know, mimic him and make fun of him and do it, and then his dad would beat him for it. And that's often been used as an example of, Lincoln is not religious. See how he's, you know, made fun of it. But the amazing thing, any of us know anything about comedy and mimicking, in order to be a mimic or a comic, you've got to understand what the people are saying to make fun of it. And that's exactly So some of those very same sermons and verses that he mimicked as a kid become some of the great verses we quote today. And I am one who believes, in fact, that uh, like a lot of young people, Lincoln had to struggle with these questions. So when he was in New Salem, he belonged to a club, and they, they actually discussed uh, and debated uh, the virgin birth, the divinity of Christ, and, these, and that got him in a lot of trouble later, particularly when he runs the first time, uh, well, the only time, I guess, for Congress and his, and his, uh, his uh, uh, Methodist minister he's running against, who says that Lincoln scoffed at religion. He writes this beautiful letter, I actually have it in the essential Lincoln, saying, I've never made fun of any religion I, I respect at all. And there are uh, at least one minister who claims he secretly baptized Lincoln uh, when he was an adult in the White House. I don't know. It's debated. What I do know is this. If you read his speeches, if you read his farewell address to Springfield, which was done, this is the best. It was like the part I read about Lincoln on the Declaration of Independence. These were unscripted. It's when Lincoln goes off. He didn't like to do this. He read things. He knew he got in trouble. He, that's, when he was reading what I read today about all men are created, equal, must move beyond race. Up until then, throughout this speech, you can read it. It's recorded. It's recorded as a newspaper did. Hurrah, Lincoln, yay. Then when he said that, it was not a cheer or anything. He realized he had gone off and left these people, and he backed up, and he sort of ends the speech. And it's the same thing with Springfield. He starts talking about only with God's will can I accomplish this and these sorts of things. If you read his letter that he writes to the free African Americans who send him a Bible and respond back, it's hard to believe he isn't. And my own view is this. He had a deep relationship with God, as he understood it but, it, but it was different. He believed that God had called him for something. It's, it's more complicated because Southern honor we think of as a good thing. But it's, if you think about it, not, Southern honor is usually compared with this sort of Northern dignity. Dignity is something that supposedly Northern, and it's internal. It's how you feel. Southern honor depends on what other people think of you. The, the esteem of others. And Lincoln is always talking about his esteem in this, particularly as a young man. And that is, uh, they think he's going to kill himself if he breaks off his marriage the first time with Mary, breaks off the engagement Mary Todd. And he says to him, well, no, I couldn't kill myself because I haven't amounted to anything. He, he's got to amount to this sort of southern honor. And I actually think the way out of that is he comes to believe that God has called him to do something special. He's not even sure what it is, but he believes. And Lincoln knew his Bible so well. He read it so well. That most of us, like myself, grew up and we read about Moses sees the burning bush. He says, God says, you're going to go into Egypt and bring your people out. And he says, I can't do that, God. And God says, I'll go with you. And so he does. Or Jonah, you know, and he says, no, I'm not going to do it. And he tries to run away, get some to 
digestive juices from the whale in his eyes and said, okay, I'll go to Nineveh. But the Bible is full of all these references where God calls people or his people to do things and they don't do them. And they don't get done or, you know, a day in God's time is a thousand years. And Lincoln knew these things and he was convinced that God had called him and he was doing God or it wouldn't be done. That's sort of a roundabout answer, but I I am convinced he was a man of, of great faith, but it developed. Interestingly, most people have argued, I think it's before this, it's during the Civil War itself that it happened. Jefferson Davis was less religious probably than Abraham Lincoln, and after that war he becomes as devout an Episcopalian as you have ever seen. And I think it would be hard for two men responsible for the death of so many people not to try to find a higher meaning, a way of understanding this death and things that are going on. So there's lots of debates on this. I think we'll never really know. I I don't. I I personally believe, yes, he was a person of of faith in the way he related to, to God and things. But many don't, so you should know that. Yes, sir. In light of your views, can you explain Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I actually have a paper I've written on this. Uh, there's no doubt that, that this is something that, you know, he's going to be criticized for and remembered uh, over and over. He explained it. There's one letter in the essential Lincoln where, you know, he goes and uses Andrew Jackson as an example because it's Democrats who are attacking him and says, well, you know, Jackson and others did this. Uh, I think he overestimated the dissent or what he saw as might be. Um, the centers in the North, there were all sorts. There were crackpots. There were also people who really did want to help the Confederacy overthrow it, and most people, I think, just had good reason to be the centers. But he did suspend habeas corpus. Uh, I think what, how he tried to justify it was he tried to do it locally and end it as quickly as it could be each time uh, to justify it. Um, but it will be something, I think, that, that is part of this legacy that's often called upon as a, on telling up a negative side of Lincoln. If he had not been able to do that, though, he might not have had an army at one time if, if they had ruled otherwise in, in terms of the draft, and it wouldn't be the Union. And the way he tried to explain it was you had to do the greater good. His job was to keep the country together by the Constitution, the rule of law. In order to do that, he had to sometime do the, break the, what we would think of breaking the laws to keep to have a country together at all. Uh, I can send you the paper, if you'd like to, that goes in detail. Some of it in the book, but I have a a whole paper that goes through all of these sort of uh, uh, civil liberties and things where Lincoln... uh, You've got to remember, this was not just war with us with Iraq, but this was a civil war. And when I talk about all the Southerners in Illinois and Indiana, uh, many of them were Confederate sympathizers as well. Uh, It was sort of a crackpot scheme, but remember uh, uh, Milligan and those that actually were going to try to do a John Brown raid uh, on, on, um, on one of the prisons and escape people. So th- there was some of this stuff behind it. Is that good enough for you? If you'll email me and you'd like to see the paper that outlines sort of case by case, I'm happy to send it to you. It's not published, just I, I presented it at a um, thing in San Francisco early this year, September. Yes, sir. And I don't mind staying around afterwards either. I'm sorry, it was what? Was Lincoln more of a liberal? Well, that, not necessarily how we define it now, I guess, but in his own time, he sort of seems In race, certainly. Uh, what we tend to forget about Lincoln is that um, depends on what you mean by a liberal. That's why I did the little thing at the beginning about how he believed it. What, what would have been the Republican Party was government intervention in doing it. I mean, we switched things. Lincoln told a great story that may answer this in a different way. 
I don't know if I included a little bit of it in Age of Lincoln. I'm not sure if I was able to put this in those 30 documents or not, but I loved it. He was asked to speak uh, to the Jefferson Club, and he wrote this letter on the He couldn't go, so instead he wrote a letter, and he said, you know, this sort of reminds me about, um, about two fellows I saw in Springfield having a fight. I don't know if you folks saw the long riders, these long coats people used to wear, you know, that sort of thing. Had these, uh, so they didn't have to worry. They were drunk, so they didn't hurt each other. They got all tangled up. When they came out, they changed coats and didn't even know it. And he said, that's sort of what happened with the political parties, you know, that uh, Jefferson's party and this. He says, uh, you know, the, the Republicans are for, are for uh, uh, making money. He said, that's what the Democrats are for. But we're also for the man when it comes to the two, the Republican stand put the man first, then the money. And, you know, it, it's confusing over time as the change. Even when I was growing up, most African Americans that I knew, the president of NACP, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, uh, father, were Republicans and voted Republican Party. Uh, people say it changed with FDR, but not that much in the, in the, in the national election because it was still seen as the party of Lincoln and the party of emancipation. And certainly up until the 20th century, if there's any party that does any right for African Americans, it's there. It depends on what you mean by, though, the liberal and conservative. There's no doubt in terms of his belief in the rule of law. People would say, and he's conservative, people would say he would be conservative on the Emancipation Proclamation because he thought he couldn't emancipate people. It was a war measure. But he was sort of radical on the idea that once he did it, that, in fact, he would not back off, and he pushed. And he didn't push for much with Congress. He, sort of, he pushed for the 13th Amendment because he was afraid it would be undone uh, because it was a war measure afterwards. Incidentally, you know, Kentucky didn't pass the uh, 13th Amendment until 1976. <laughs> it was a border state, so it didn't have to. The southern states, the Confederate states, that is, had to, to, to get back in. I'm not answering your question very well. I Maybe we can talk about it later. I have my own ideas. Yeah, I think that's a good question because he was a railroad lawyer. He was a corp he, so he really believed in capitalism, the opportunity to make it what he thought that everybody ought to have a fair opportunity to do it. Is that conservative or liberal, you know? And, and that he believed in rewarding his friends. Uh, that's why he was such a good friend. I'll, I'll tell you one quick story. I got a letter. I wrote this book, and I know what I meant to say, but I learned it's not what you write. It's somebody else's book when they read it. George Bush, when he was president, wrote me this letter, and almost all presidents have identified with Lincoln, whether Democrats or, or uh, Republicans have some way identified with Lincoln inspired. The, it was the later, the, uh, uh, George W. And uh, yeah, there were a couple of things, my argument about Lincoln religion, but the, the main thing was this, my argument that Lincoln bought liberty, and what he saw himself doing was doing that for the rest of the world. And secondly, that like Lincoln, he was unpopular about doing it, but later was seen, at, or I think he hopes that it would be seen as different. And it made me realize this is certainly not the way I wrote this book. If anything, I thought it was an anti-war book, but how people read things and interpret it makes a, the logic it makes a huge difference. And that goes to the point, I think, of liberal or conservative, you know, is how you read. And so both liberal and conservatives, atheist and devout, you know, Baptists all claim Lincoln. I think there's something that's, he, he sort of, they said he belonged to the ages, where they said angels are ages. I think that's it. He's, he's become universal us. I mean that U.S., you know, the United States. He, he sort of represents what we are, and we all read either our good or our bad into him. That's why I argue history is sort of an interpretation. I'm happy to answer. If you have any other questions or if you're shy, feel free to email me. I, I will. I can be slow, but I will get back to you. I promise. And uh, and don't feel you know feel free to disagree with me. Sometimes I disagree with me.